Hello, uh, and welcome to another Cavalry Conversation here at uh, NYU Journalism. Uh, my name's Dan Fagan, and I'm the director of the Science, Health, and Environmental Reporting Program and the Science Communication Workshops uh, here at NYU. Uh, we are, just want to remind everybody that uh, all of this happens because of the generosity of the Cavalry Foundation. I want to thank them because I don't always remember to thank them. Uh, for their sponsorship of this series. Uh, I also wanted to mention, I think Lee will talk about some of the other events we have planned, but I, I did want to give a, a special plug. Uh, October 25th, David oh, yeah. Quammen will be here, uh, mm -hmm. and we'll be talking about writing. I don't think we're going to actually live stream and record that one, so you've got to come in person uh, if you want to hear David, who is one of, one of the great uh, science writers. Uh, and speaking of, we have two wonderful science communicators uh, with us today, three of course, including our moderator. Uh, I'm very grateful to Jennifer and Carl for being here, thank you very much. Uh, and always grateful to Robert Lee Holtz, Distinguished Writer in Residence and Science here at the Carter Institute and Science Writer at the Wall Street Journal and uh, now moderating what's got to be his one billionth uh, <laughs> evening <laughs> event for us. Uh, uh, so thank you very much, Lee, and uh, take it away. Yeah, and thank you, Dan, and with enough practice, I think I'll get this right. <laughs> <coughs> so welcome, everybody, to the Cavalry Conversation on Science Communication. So this is the second in our fall series. Um, we're here to explore how the story of science reaches the general public, uh, and in particular, we're here this evening to have a conversation about what surely is the third rail in American science journalism. And that's our coverage of human heredity and population genetics and race. It's one that science journalists often bobble. All of our Cavalry conversations are webcast nationally, as Dan said, uh, thanks to the Cavalry Foundation, but also to the NYU Science, Health, and Environmental Reporting Program, of which uh, Dan is director. So quickly looking ahead, on November 15th, we'll have a special screening of a new science documentary, The Most Unknown. And uh, adding to the interest of that, we'll have the filmmaker, Ian Cheney, will come and discuss uh, his work there, and also one of the starring researchers, uh, Penn State geoscientist uh, Jennifer McAlady. The, uh, uh, on December 6th, we'll then pivot and uh, have a conversation about the disputed science of nutrition with two leaders in the coverage of industrialization of our food. And that's uh, author Paul Greenberg, who some of you may know from his classic Four Fish. Uh, it's a new book out on omega-3. And noted NYU food studies professor Marion Nestle, who also has a book out debunking many of the food industry claims. And it should be pretty interesting. Let us begin here tonight, though, with an essential question. Who are you? Who am I? How do we add up collectively as a room full of diverse chemical codes? What do we mean as a collection of traits, a population group, or a people? In this evening's conversation, I'd like to explore with you and with our two speakers here who've been nice enough to join us, the many ways we can misconstrue it, misuse it, twist it, turn it to a political end. What kinds of mistakes are we making as science journalists? What kinds of distortions are we introducing as scientists trying very hard to explain this to a credulous public? How much damage do we do in the public understanding of science? And how can we correct it? So those of you who are watching online, you can tweet any questions you may have using the hashtag Cavalry Convo. And I remind you here, if you'd like to ask a question, please do. But use the microphone so those online can hear you. And we can record your query for posterity. So, Carl Zimmer, or as those of you who may have read his most recent book, 
individual Z. <laughs> now, surely, Carl was one of the world's best known and arguably most well-regarded and well-liked science writers. He's an author, journalist, teacher, podcaster, lecturer, university professor, Yale adjunct professor. He writes the Matter column for the New York Times, and he contributes to the Atlantic, National Geographic, Wired, Scientific American. He's appeared on many radio programs, including National Public Radio's Radio Lab, Fresh Air, in This American Life. Now, the reason he appears so frequently on Fresh Air is because he's actually written 13 books, and it is his most recent book that brings us here tonight. She has her mother's laugh. The Power, Perversions, and Potential of Heredity. Publication was greeted by the chorus of accolades. Extraordinary, says the New York Times Book Review. Magisterial, says the Atlantic. Engrossing, says Wired. Leading contender is the most outstanding nonfiction work of the year, says the Minneapolis Star Tribune. Have I embarrassed you yet? Yep. <laughs> His work has been anthologized in both the Best American Science Writing Series and Best American Science and Nature Writing Series. And among many honors, Carl is a three-time winner of the American Association for the Advancement of Science's Journalism Award. And he is, as he's fond of pointing out to us, the only writer after whom a species of tapeworm has been named. <laughs> but I have to uh, confess that my favorite part of his resume is the line where he admits that he's an English major. <laughs> I am a proud English major. So am I. Rock on. <laughs> and from Kansas, we are very gratified to have with us Jennifer Raff, professor of anthropology at the University of Kansas. She has a deep interest, uh, both personally and professionally, in population genetics, bioarchaeology, ancient DNA, and the paleogenome. Her research focuses on the genetic roots of the first Americans and the indigenous people of North America. She teaches fundamentals of physical anthropology and human evolution. She's vice president of the American Association of Anthropological uh, Genetics. She's author of a handbook on science literacy and is working on a new book uh, which will treat on the origins of uh, the peoples of North America. But she's not just a scientist. She has a flair for reaching out to the public. As a blogger, she's written for The Guardian and The Huffington Post, and now Forbes, on topics ranging from the bones of Amelia Earhart to the secrets of human evolution contained in spit. Her own personal blog, Violent Metaphors, has about four and a half, four point eight million readers. And there she regularly debunks pseudoscience rails against the anti-vaccine movement, and pushes back against conspiracy theorists. Forbes has named her one of the eight awesome anthropologists advancing public outreach. So, one estimate uh, that I've seen in MIT Technology Review suggests that the number of American adults who now have access to some form of personal genomic data is around one in 25. So that's at least a couple of us in the room and maybe a couple of us on the podium. Now, you both have a very 21st century relationship with your heredity. Carl, you had your entire genome sequenced as part of this uh, writing exercise. They had consulted a team of experts. You posted it online for analysis. Um, Jennifer, uh, you've had genetic testing and counseling as part of your recent pregnancy, and I believe also as class project, uh, went through a 23andMe DNA ancestry uh, testing experience. I wonder if you could uh, just help us set the stage as we begin here, how this sort of DNA knowledge about yourself um, has affected or altered your coverage, your approach to this topic. Um, and Carl, let's start with you. Sure, I mean, for me, um, it, this was a, a real um, profound uh, uh, illustration of just how far uh, genetics has come. Because when I started as, as a science writer in, in the early 90s, there was no genome. You didn't talk about genomes. The idea of sequencing the whole genome was crazy. And it wasn't until the end of the 1990s that the first draft of the human genome, singular, 
was sequenced, and that cost like $3 billion. Um, and you know, my, uh, my first child was, was born uh, in uh, 2001, and you know, like, the idea of like, knowing what was in her genome or in my genome was crazy. It would be like, you know, do you want to go to the moon? Because you know, like, it was so expensive. Um, and yet, uh, a couple years ago, um, a geneticist who I had written about, he got in touch with me and he said like, hey, like, we're gonna be having this meeting and for you know, a little extra money, if you want, uh, we can sequence your genome and interpret it for you. And I was like, are you kidding? And so yeah, I totally jumped on that um, and it really helped in terms of the research for the book. And, um, and I, I wanted to get the, the, the data. I didn't want someone just to tell me, well, this is what we see in your genome. I wanted my genome. So hope by hook and by crook, I managed to get an external hard drive delivered to my door, and I've got it. And so it's a really um, marvelous experience to be able to go to scientists and say, like, would you mind just taking a look at this and just telling me, like, what you see in it as a scientist who studies genomes. And then my genome's not special, but it's a, it's a way for me to dive into this whole science of understanding what's in our genome, what it tells us about diseases, what it tells us about evolution, what it tells us about our history. Um, and it's just a wonderful experience. And I, I keep learning from it. You know, and every and, and this, is, this is Grant. What did it tell us about you? About me? Yeah, what was the surprise in there for you? Um, there was one. Do you now consider yourself like you know an American Indian? I mean that you know you discovered that your ancestors yeah. founded Troy. I mean, what? Uh, there seems to be a lot more ancestry from Southern Europe than my very good genealogi genealogist relatives had found. So there needs to be a certain you know um, reckoning with that. <laughs> you know? So so it it sort of altered your family story. Yes, except that I take these things very tentatively, and I think everybody needs to. Like, if you get some results, just think of that as like, this is our best guess as of 2018, because like as of 2019, it could just change profoundly, and you shouldn't take it personally. It's just that the, this science is very early and very crude, so you know, if you get a result that tells you that you are, say, 18% Italian, it's not like saying you're like 18% nitrogen, you know, it's, it's a very sort of tentative determination of how much your DNA resembles the DNA of a group of people sampled from this region. So, so in a sense, it's, if it's, it's fair to say that you had a kind of academic response to this. It doesn't sound like uh, well, I, I you, was you, you went into the room by yourself and started weeping copiously because... <laughs> No, thank goodness I didn't. No, 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 no. I was, I, look, I mean, before you get your genome sequenced, you don't know what you're going to find. Uh -huh. and, and, like, I was in a group of, like, 40 people yeah. at this meeting who got their genome sequenced. And there were five of them where there were these clinical geneticists who were like, we have to talk. Like, uh -huh. in other words, you know, roughly five, five people in a mm -hmm. group of 40 would discover that there's a mutation in their genome that they need to talk to their doctor now. So Jennifer, you encountered this in a slightly different framework, mm -hmm. first as an expectant mother, mm -hmm. and then as a professor who was teaching this technology as a, as a thing. And so I'm curious if you'd share with us, if you don't mind, um, what you found that either interested you or surprised you yeah. about what you first learned as a, as a pregnant mother, and then how that compared to what you found out 12 months later or two years later when the technology had progressed a bit and you took the second sort of more direct ancestry analysis. Sure. Um, so I've never been interested in my own ancestry at all, at all. So very different than Carl. Um, I've hyper-focused on the populations that I'm interested in doing research with um, and never was, never gave a thought to my own genome, didn't really care, except oh, am I contaminating these DNA samples that I'm working with from 1,000-year-old individuals, right? Um, but when I got pregnant, uh, I, re I remembered, oh my gosh, my family has a genetic disorder that I need to be aware of, I need to be uh, taken into account with this pregnancy. 
I'm not going to say what that is out of respect for the privacy of my other family members who might be affected by it, but um, so I should, and I realized, oh, I should have done this before I got pregnant, but now that I am, um, I insisted that my husband and I go to a genetic counselor. And I always tell people in the general public, I have a PhD in genetics and I still go to a genetic counselor to get help with interpreting my results. It's hard to, I think, assess your own DNA yourself, even when you're nominally an expert at genetics. Um, so I went, and my husband went, and we had these DNA tests done, and the results were very relieving. Um, I'm not a carrier of the uh, variant that causes this disorder, so we were fine. And it gave me um, a lot of peace of mind throughout my pregnancy. The one thing I knew was okay. Mm -hmm. You know, you get you're sort of terrified all the rest mm -hmm. of the time, but this was one this one thing I knew was fine, and I think that was a little bit different than your experience mm -hmm. much earlier. But it did tell me something surprising, which is that um, I was getting this DNA test done, and the, the counselor was going through the results, and she said, "Okay, Jennifer, so are you Jewish by any chance?" Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I said, "No." <laughs> I'm, my family is Irish Catholic on one side and Polish Catholic on the other. We don't have any tradition of being Jewish in our family whatsoever. And she said, well, you're carrying some markers for some genetic disorders that we associate with Ashkenazi populations. And it's not anything to be concerned about, but you know, you should be aware of this. So I was very surprised by that. <laughs> so um, it was about six months later, actually, not, okay. a, not two years, unfortunately. All right, so. Didn't have that much maternity leave, okay. but I, I taught this course uh, for my students, and, and, and one of the primary goals of this course was if they wanted to, and we did a whole unit on informed consent and how to go through that process, but if they wanted to, they had the option of taking an ancestry test and exploring those results critically and talking about the kinds of issues that Carl raised. And um, for the students who might not wish to interrogate their own genomes, I said, well, you can use my genome as sort of, you know, hmm. pretend, right? So they had an option that they could do that. Um, so I went ahead and, and, and went through 23andMe, and um, I made my students who chose to do these tests um, come up with a hypothesis to test. And my hypothesis, which I gave them, was, well, perhaps I have some Jewish ancestry. And we did the tests, and it turns out, yeah, I do have some, and it was very surprising. <laughs> So uh, I ended up going back to my family, and I, I suspected it was from the Polish side of the family, and I went and talked to my grandfather about this, and I wondered how he would react, <laughs> but he was like, yeah, okay, that makes sense, Poland, Ashkenazi Jews in Poland, probably somebody married mm -hmm. into our family. So it didn't change my perception of who I am, and, and perhaps this mm -hmm. is a way to get into mm -hmm. issues of identity versus ancestry, so it hasn't mm -hmm. changed who I, know myself mm -hmm. to be, but it was kind yeah. of an interesting little... So it sort of, you know, medically, it was mm -hmm. nothing, which yeah. was great. Thank goodness. And, but it sort of enriched, if I may put it yeah. that way, your family story. It gave me a story to tell, and I think that's what a lot of these ancestry tests are Gave you are a story for. to tell. Yeah, you come up with uh -huh. stories about that's yourself. That's kind of a, a very nice segue to the thing I want to ask you about next. What I think this is a, a, a rich and a, a contentious sort of topic area, and what I would like to do is kind of frame our conversation periodically by offering you a little example. Uh, uh, sadly, most of them drawn from the past 12 months of how <laughs> science journalists or the public have, um, uh, well, it's the nicest possible way to say it would just be just sort of got it d something deeply and profoundly wrong, uh, something that you'd think they'd know better about. And the first one I want to talk to you about or ask your opinion about is actually it's as recently as this past March, um, NASA astronaut Scott Kelly, uh, who famously is number one, uh, one of, uh, I think, the only set of twins who've ever been in the astronaut, astronaut corps and who have gone into space and who also famously spent a year in, in space and even more famously uh, spent that year being tested in all kinds of ways, um, uh, including, a, a, as was his twin on, on Earth, as a kind of comparative genomics, biological, um, uh, control blind study. And when he came back, there was this amazing spate of headlines, and I do mean dozens of stories in some of the most prominent publications. <laughs> the Today Show, CNN, USA Today, Time, Newsweek, People, Huffington Post, and I won't bore you, that just suggested very flatly that uh, Colonel Kelly's 
DNA had been dramatically and measurably altered by his time in space. His DNA was different. Oh my God. Um, what does this mean for humans in space and spaceflight? All of these publications, all of these science writers were wrong. There was no sort of alteration to his gene structure. There was his, uh, what they had taken was a very simple elevation in gene expression as a permanent genetic change. This is supposed to be the sort of thing that you and I, and maybe you because you blog, so we'll drag you into the guilty thing and some of you in the room, we're not supposed to get this kind of simple stuff wrong, and yet we, we so seriously did. I'm wondering two things from your perspective as the journalist and your perspective as the scientist and the blogger. How could this happen? How could this be? Is the scientific literacy of science journalists such that such an elementary thing could be so um, wrong? So part of the issue here is that um, we, 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 we have um, we learned as a society about genes and, and about DNA in the, over the past few decades, um, but we've not just learned about it, but we've fixated on it. So, um, so we think that if you look inside a cell, all there is is DNA, which is crazy. Like, if you look at a, D a DNA inside of a cell, it is totally swathed in other molecules. There are um, certain molecules that like clamp on to certain sections of DNA and just silence them. There are other molecules that help to wind it up into little coils and so on. And all of these things determine which genes can actually do something and which are silenced. And what uh, scientists found when they looked at Scott Kelly's cells was that some of these genes were showing different kinds of activity than others. So you know, you've got genetics and you have what scientists call epigenetics. You have mm -hmm. these two different realms. And it, they're important, okay. but, um, but you know, because we have this fixation on, on genes, um, if, if someone sends out a press release that says like, oh, like Scott Kelly's genes have changed in the way they work, people say like, oh my God, they, you know, he is different because his genes somehow have changed and your genes are you and so he's like, he's now an alien or something. Anyway, it really got- He was no longer an identical twin. Yeah, it was, um, it was so out of control. And, 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 and Kelly himself, I think, like, uh, I believe he had said, said like, oh, oh, I, I kind of misunderstood what they told me. Like, he was sort of like under the impression his DNA had changed too. And it's just, it is very frustrating and, and, and I mean, for goodness sake, like anybody who's gonna write about genetics and epigenetics is gonna have to understand the fundamental difference between them. All right, well, you know that and understand it, and I know that and understand it, and that's because we're English majors. Yeah, there you go, <laughs> exactly. But Jennifer, you wrote the handbook on scientific literacy. Oh, yes. So going forward, you know, should all uh, you know, science journalists, all journalists who are going to be uh, writing on this topic be required to take a kind of basic uh, fluency and literacy test? Should we get a genetic driver's license? What? No, no, but I, I worry about this more from, well, first of all, Scott Kelly didn't understand his own results. That's, that's a real red flag to me, that somebody was not communicating with him properly. That, that really troubles me. Um, because if you're doing research with human subjects, they really should understand what you're doing and what the results are, so yikes. Um, Coming from this from the perspective of somebody who does research, um, but then also tries to communicate mm -hmm. about research with the public, it's, it's difficult because scientists are not trained to speak to journalists. It's not part of our training, typically. Nor are we trained to write for the general public. That is a very painful process for us, uh, as I'm sure you know. And mainly, when we publish our results, are, if it happens to be something exciting and newsworthy, our main liaison is our public affairs person or our, I don't know, you know, the, the representative at the university and we have to work through that person in order to craft sort of the story. And so I think maybe it's a lesson for the scientists to work very closely with 
that person and make sure that what they're saying in their press releases reflects what the science actually is. Um, but also, perhaps scientists should go through some media training um, or seek it out if you're planning to have results that you can't really plan on this. But if you think your results might go, go into the press, you know, it might be a good idea to get some media training um, because I can tell you, the first time Carl Zimmer interviewed me, <laughs> it was terrifying. Yeah. Was she uh, a good interview? I, I'm sure he doesn't remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. It was yeah, absolutely yeah. terrifying. So, and and this is true of all scientists. Let me tell you, you know. So, it, it, it have some some sympathy for the scientists. They have no idea what they're doing when it comes to talking to the media. Um, That's a problem. Yeah, it is. It is. And so, um, maybe more joint trainings where yeah. you know. Would be, it is would the case us. that, you know, often in these instances, someone blames the press release. Yeah. And in this case, they seem to blame the press release with some. Justification. Yeah, yeah. The press um, release was the problem. The, another interesting finding I'm quoting from the press release concerned what some call the space gene. What? Okay. <laughs> You're making no? me sad. What? what? You don't, you don't, you've never heard of the space, the space gene? gene? Where did you get your PhD? It's right next to the gay Indiana? gene. Yeah, yeah think, right. I think, know? yeah, next to the gay gene and before the, you yeah. know. Um, yeah, no, truly, truly, truly. The I'm space genuinely gene, shocked the space by that. Gene. Well, I'm glad that we were able to, Oof. you know, get your adrenaline going. <laughs> I want to, though, so, okay. Um, you need to learn, you generically need to learn um, how to talk to journalists yes. or how to talk to your university relations mm -hmm. people. Um, you need to, like, read the press release and then call around and ask some people, what does this really mean? Um, call that Zimmer guy. He knows. <laughs> I want to expand this a little bit now from misunderstanding just of the simple technical how do genes work um, problem to the broader uh, question of the, the pitfalls of population genetics and consumer testing. And I call your attention to the very curious story that surfaced um, this past September where a, a, a fellow, uh, a white man in Seattle, um, is uh, suing the federal government because uh, he is an insurance uh, company owner and has taken a consumer DNA test that suggests that he is, has in his many base pairs 4% that would be characterized as sub-Saharan African. And by his understanding of how the world works, this makes him an African American and he therefore should qualify for minority set-aside contracts designed to benefit uh, African Americans and businesses owned by women. Um, you know, has he got part of this wrong? I mean, uh, he has uh, sub-Saharan African DNA. Doesn't that make him, you know, uh, part of our, our diverse uh, rainbow of uh, ethnicity? Uh, do, you, do you see this kind of thing distorting our understanding of who we are, number one. And number two, how as journalists and science writing scientists, what's our role here? How do we, how do we handle this? Well, <laughs> I think part of the issue here is that um, as a society, um, we've never really quite sorted out what we mean by these racial categories. Like what is the what is the definition of being white or black or Native American or Hispanic? What does it mean? Um, and like there are there are many dimensions to an answer to that. Um, but um, you know, like if you look at different places at different times, people would say different things. So, you know, there was literally like a legal definition So, you know, if you could, if one if, drop rule meaning meaning that uh, that if you had even a quote unquote drop of black quote unquote blood, this is all pre genetics, um, then you were legally defined as black, and therefore you were like, God help you, like because like you know in places like Virginia, you were you were sort of cat set off in a separate category according to a one drop rule. Um, you, you cannot marry someone who is defined as white. 
Um, and so what, what did the one drop rule mean? Well, it was it a was, uh, good question. You know, it was, it was just sort of what the state would define as it. Ironically, uh, in Virginia, which actually codified this in the 1920s, this mm -hmm. is not long ago, um, they had a little bit of a problem because they were trying to define whiteness and blackness. And a lot of the prominent families in Virginia, I talk about this in my book, a lot of the prominent families in Virginia loved to talk about how they were direct descendants of Pocahontas. <laughs> it sort of made them feel cool about the themselves. Famous white person, yes. <laughs> well, it sort of like gave them a little bit of like, mm -hmm. you know, interest to their mm -hmm. ancestry. Um, but this was a problem if you're gonna try to use ideas like the one drop rule to set up racial barriers. Because what it means is a lot of the most prominent people in Virginia were not white. So they created something that is actually called the Pocahontas exception. So that you have you had a certain, <laughs> I'm not making this up, Google it, Pocahontas exception. If you, if, if you were white, and had a, up to a certain fraction of Native American ancestry, you were still white. If you had that same, if that fraction was from African ancestry, guess what, you're black. So I don't think there's any simple answer to this situ situation that we're now getting into with genetic testing. I, I'd be curious well, to know what you think. I wanna then ask Jennifer, so, the Pocahontas rule, I didn't appreciate that was gonna come up, but it does sort of lead into your work in a funny way. Sure. Um, the attitudes that we talk about here, pretty much so far, um, have been kind of sort of Euro-American ideas of uh, genetics, the importance of genetics underlies our conversation, um, and what genetics means. Now your specialty, your, your work is looking at uh, indigenous peoples in the Americas broadly, but specifically in North America. So, I mean, how, I, I don't mean this, but how does the Pocahontas rule play for the people that you study? Are, do, are genes even a factor in, say, tribal definitions uh, and such? Not most tribes. I mean, I can't think of one that uses genetic ancestry testing as a criterion for tribal membership. It's important to understand that to belong to a tribe, every tribe is, is sovereign and they have their own ideas and their own rules about who belongs and, and what that belonging means and what the criteria for belonging are. And um, the sort of, if you guys heard of blood quantum, like that, that notion that you are a certain percentage of your ancestors belong to that tribe at a certain date, um, I can't explain it properly, but. Um, that idea was imposed upon uh, tribes as a, me a means of limiting tribal membership in the future by uh, Europeans. Um, tribal belonging is much more a cultural and sociopolitical construction. It's not how, what percentage Native American ancestry do you have? Um, although plenty of European descended folks will say, will take a test and say, oh, I've got, 4% Native American ancestry, therefore I should I get to be Native American. And that's not how that works. It is not for the geneticist like me to decide who is Native American and who is not. That's certainly not something we can do. Um, there is a really wonderful um, quote that I'm going to butcher who said this first, but I learned it from um, a, a Kim Tallbear, who's a, a prominent Native American scholar and um, she got it from somebody else, and I'm totally forgetting who it is now, I'm very sorry. Um, but the, the quote is, you are not who you claim, speaking of tribal identity, hmm. but rather who claims you, right? So hmm. we can go around and say, oh, I've got Native American ancestry, that makes me Native American. That's not the case. If you do not grow up in a community, if you're not claimed by a tribe, then you're not Native American, and that's plain and simple. Um, or perhaps you know you may not be connected to a tribe because of colonialism, and that's a whole separate situation. Um, and reconnection is a problem, mm. but I'm not going to get into that. That's beyond my ability to talk about. Um, but as a geneticist, I have come a long way in learning how to talk about these issues from Native Americans. So I work with mostly ancient DNA and studying Native American ancestors and understanding their histories, and I. Came into the, I came across this problem of language where I would talk about Native American alleles or the Native American mitochondrial DNA or so forth. 
And I actually got contacted by somebody who said, hey, look, you're racializing us when you use that kind of language. And I was like, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, look at tribes today. Many of us have varying proportions of what you would call Native American ancestry. Many of us have a lot of ancestry from Europeans and from African Americans. And we are all still equally Native American because we all still belong to this tribe. But when you talk about Native American genes or Native American DNA, we understand that's a shorthand for what you're doing, but that lazy language is actually creating a problem for us because it's cementing in the public's mind this notion that genes equal identity and tribal belonging. And that was kind of a revelation to me, and I listened to him, and I was like, okay. So now I try to talk about it in better ways, and I slip up sometimes, but it's something for us as researchers to keep mm -hmm. in mind. Mm -hmm. And this doesn't just mean Native Americans, it means every population. We have to be careful not to um, uh, oversimplify things with our language. And I think a big problem for us right now is we don't, our language hasn't evolved to keep pace with this. Okay, this, so I, I pre appreciate you bringing that up because that's something that I, I wanted to get your thoughts on, that as journalists and as scientists who are reaching out to the public, you know, we, we, we try to find a common language to talk about these very complicated topics that maybe we only half understand ourselves. Um, and what you're telling me is that our habits of language as journalists, as uh, science writers, um, there's a problem embedded in those. So what do we do? We have to move away from typological thinking. Typological yes. thinking. Yes. I'm not sure I understand what that means. <laughs> so humans are really, really good, or at least Western traditional, tradition educated humans are, are really, really uh, good at categorizing things into types. And if you go back through the history of physical anthropology, which we now call ourselves biological anthropologists, to distance ourselves from that history. Um, we, as a discipline, have a lot to answer for because we were the ones who measured crania, measured skulls, and tried to come up with the, the, the African type and the European, or we called it the Caucasoid and the Negroid and the Mongoloid types, right? This ideal specimen of a cranium that fit these perfect measurements, and that was the type. And we tried to fit in then every other person into one of these categories. And that, as Carl talks quite a bit about in his book, really influenced eugenics. Um, we still have that notion. Are you this group? Are you that group? When in reality, we're mixtures of, most of us are very mixed. We have lots of ancestry from lots right. of populations. So if we can stop thinking of these categories as these fixed, entities will get somewhere. <laughs> okay. But that's step one, I think. Right. But I'm, I'm, I'm back with that guy in Seattle. Mm -hmm. Okay, whatever he's really up to, who knows. But, mm -hmm. you know, he, he's, he has the thought process. He's my reader. You know, I have written stories for him that have basically taught him to think about um, his biological, biochemical, molecular makeup in this way that you can that it's a palette and I can go, okay, that's, that's that stuff and that's this stuff. So Carl, how do I write about that so I don't create that mindset? Well, as we're moving forward, because this yeah. stuff is accelerating at absolutely. an astonishing speed. No, absolutely. Like, I mean, like the, the fact that there are, you know, 20 million or whatever the number is now, people in the United States who've gotten their, gene, their DNA sequenced is astonishing and, and and the curve is like this. It's going to be many tens of millions of people. So I, I think journalists have to get used to writing to an audience that is looking at its own DNA. And that's a, really, that's a big shift from just a few years ago. So, so what, how do we write about the DNA that our readers are looking at? And, and I think that for starters, we need to say one mutation or another mutation here or there is not the same thing as some sort of uh, like full cultural ethnic meaning to your life. I mean, I, I was reading about somebody who like who thought that she was mostly Irish and, and she discovered that she had a lot of Italian ancestry and so all of a sudden she's like making pasta. 
And it's like, what? The, the pasta gene's right next to the <laughs> gay gene, which is next to the space gene, right? My attitude is like, what have you been waiting for? Like, like <laughs> pasta is fantastic. Like, and you don't need to actually be Italian to enjoy uh -huh. pasta. Uh -huh. But it, but it, like, don't switch to pasta because you think suddenly, like, oh, I have the pasta yeah. gene. Yeah. Like somehow that equating genes with a heritage. You know, our heritage is cultural. And genes may play a role because they're sort of carried along uh -huh. in groups of people. But um, I think it's a sort of, it's, it was very interesting to me, actually. Uh, there was a, there was somebody uh, from Germany. I was a biologist in Germany, and we were talking about um, the, the 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 DNA craze. And I was like, so I know this is really popular in the United States. Is this the same in Germany? And he's like, no, not really. And I was like, huh? Because it's taken off here like crazy. And he's like, yeah, we all know where we're from. You know, like, well, like yeah, I'm from point. Germany, like, fair and point. you know, like, and and, and so, like, um, I think that is it is um, particularly uh, interesting to Americans, because you know, if if you are um, if you are of European ancestry, you're not quite sure where everything came from in the past. Uh, if you're African American, you were brought, your ancestors were brought as sure. slaves, and your genealogy is completely erased. Mm -hmm. So you need DNA to make up for the lack of the paper trail. Um, in the United States, we have a spe DNA sort of like has mm. this special meaning for us. I think that is, you know, I think in different countries, people will look at DNA in different ways, um, and and you know, I think that's another thing to bear in mind. Are you writing for an American audience? You have to sort of bear in mind like what is our sort of what is our own cultural obsession with our genealogy, and how does that influence how we look at our DNA? So we've been talking about contemporary identity, I guess. And, and I, your point is, is interesting. Uh, this, this genetic identity is kind of something we wear, um, like a dress. I mean, I'm a pasta person now. Um, but it's also in some very interesting and influential ways changing our sense of our deep past. Um, everyone who is a Neanderthal, please raise your hand, right? Um, not so many years ago, that was an insult. Now, <laughs> we're very proud of having, pick a number, they're all made up, 4%, 3%, 2%. They're not uh, made up. As a generic? They're rough. <laughs> uh, I think 23andMe just had to revise. Yes, rough. That's a nice way to put it. Right, scientists revise. But, but in any event, that we now um, wear uh, our Neanderthal heritage or our Denisovan heritage, the other new closely related species. Um, and it's interesting to me, and I w am curious about how you look at this, number one, that we so readily adopt this as a kind of great thing we have. I have viral defenses because I have uh, Neanderthal genes. I don't sneeze when I eat dark chocolate because I have Neanderthal genes. Hear me roar. Um, we are embracing of genetic diversity in our deep past in some unexpected and surprising ways and so resistant to it in our present. Yeah, no, that's actually an interesting point. Um, and and I, I, I've been sort of struck by, I mean, so, so the, 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 the Neanderthal insight came about because scientists would take these Neanderthal uh, fossils and it would start to pull bits of DNA out of it. And eventually they were able to create a whole genome. And actually they have several genomes now of Neanderthal. So these are people who became extinct 40,000 years ago. We share a common ancestor with them about 600,000 years ago. And when humans expanded out of Africa, some of them in, in maybe the Near East, in Asia, maybe in Europe, encountered Neanderthals. They had sex, they had children, and as a result, you know, there are billions of people who have a couple percent Neanderthal DNA today. And um, it's, you know, people, you know, I've sort of, people have written to me when I write about Neanderthal DNA, and I've seen this in like, you know, the comment sections of blogs, or there's like, I think that Neanderthal DNA is, is why I have so much hair. 
Um, or I'm proud of my native seal DNA because of X, Y, Z. And, and yeah, it has become, it has gone from Neanderthal being like, you know, a crude caveman to being like this sort of point of pride. Um, and, um, and there are even like racist people who have tried to, to claim that uh, the fact that Eurasians have Neanderthal DNA and Africans don't makes the Africans inferior. Have you seen this? Yes, I have, yeah. It's yeah. crazy. It's crazy. I'm sorry, would you ex ex explicate, unpack that a little uh, bit? Well, I have seen more than one white nationalist. Uh, oh, I was going to get to yeah, that. Yeah, I was going to say, you No, no, please, please. Go the ahead. racists um, say that, yeah, that they're trying to find something, anything that will make non african superior to Africans, right? It's just they're trying the to goal. find something, mm. anything. So, so they was like, okay, what's make, what makes us different? Well, non Africans have. Archa we call it archaic ancestry to encompass both Neanderthals and Denisovans, right? Yes, right? And we don't know so where archaic yeah. and maybe something else, who knows? Yeah. Um, we call it archaic ancestry. So, so non-Africans have all this archaic ancestry. That's it. That's the thing that makes them special, makes them superior. It's, I mean, it's ridiculous. So yeah. when, I, oh, and, and, the, no, fact, please, and the fact is that, that a we haven't found it yet, but Africans, at least some Africans, probably have yeah. some archaic DNA mm -hmm. as well from some human relative that was hanging around in Africa for a long time, Neanderthal-like maybe, like yeah. who knows, but like the signal is there when you look at African people's DNA. Um, it would be great if scientists could dig up a fossil, you know, preferably one 50,000 years old, preferably in Africa somewhere that has some DNA in it. And, and it a, a readout from 23andMe, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I look. In, we'll c get back together in ten years. Yeah. I would put my money that on they, they will have found it. And and so like we're all, all humans. The evidence is already in. All humans are mixtures, uh, 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 of of Homo sapiens, strictly defined, and these other people who are gone. They've left their legacy in us. You know, people in New Guinea and in the Philippines have Denisovan DNA. This this group of people we didn't even know existed 10 years ago. So, uh, but it is sad that, that, that you know, white, white nationalists, white racists who are trying to find something to hang their, their racist hat on say like, oh, it's because we're Neanderthal. I mean, the, the other thing, I mean, I don't know how much you've seen this drives me crazy is um, lactose Tolerance. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's a yeah. very uh, yeah. so so northern. <laughs> your, so I don't know how many of you are lactose intolerant versus lactose tolerant. This comes from whether you descend from a group of people who uh, who raised cattle. Natural selection favored cattle herding people who had mutations that would let them drink milk or have other dairy products as adults, probably because it helped them survive when other kinds of foods are failing. Fine. Um, the, I literally like saw uh, a, a, a some white nationalist rally where somebody was like drinking milk as like <laughs> was, like letting it splatter all over his face like ah I see I am lactose tolerant because I'm a <laughs> Northern European <laughs> and I want to I'm sort of thinking like sir not masa <laughs> <laughs> are you aware that uh, the Maasai yeah. Yeah. are lactose tolerant. <laughs> You know, like very dark skinned people in Africa are lacto tolerant, just like you. They independently evolved this, this trait because, guess what? They're cattle herders too. You're not special. Get over it. We've gotten to a topic I wanted to raise with the two of you. And, Jennifer, I know that this is something you've encountered. We, as science writers, um, whether we're coming from your side of the fence, uh, from the scientific community, or we're coming from the grand community of English majors and SHRP graduates. Um, we talk as if this is our, we act, we write, we report as if this is our conversation, that we control it, that in, in, the, in the loosest, most uh, be beneficial way, that, that we uh, are the source of uh, information that feeds into it and that we somehow or other set the terms of debate, if you like. Um, one of the things that's quite striking, and you just alluded to it, uh, both of you, is that in this era, um, there are people, we call them the alt-right, we call them white nationalists, we call them whatever you like, um, who have sort of taken up a, a pole position in that conversation. They see the papers, they 
conduct online journal clubs. They look at the graphs. I mean, it's quite articulate. And they have a kind of, what should I call it, counter-reformation population genetics thing going. I think their term is the, is it the human biodiversity movement. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, um, I, I've run into them from time to time. Mostly I encountered them the most when I wrote a, a review of Nicola, an unfavorable review of Nicholas Wade's book um, on race. And uh, I took a lot of flack for, as they pretended, that I was claiming that genetic differences between populations don't exist. Uh, that's not true. Populations are different. That's, that the difference does not equal races as we conceptualize them in our, in our um, popular culture. But setting that question aside, uh, it was unpleasant, um, although probably, I'm certain, not even a tenth of what uh, people of color have to have to deal with online. So you know, um, I, you know, I try and keep that in mind when it's when I get some sort of you know distressing threads about me on Nazi sites. I'm, I'm sure that after this conversation is posted online, we'll have some some interesting comments in various places because that tends to happen. Um, but yeah, it, and it's it's interesting because there's a very um, there there are different flavors of the white nationalists or the, the racists or the Nazis, whatever you want to call them. Um, some of them are, as you say, quite scientifically oriented and they are marshalling, trying to marshal scientific data for their arguments. Um, others are just, you know, let's send a Pepe meme at you and you know, call it a day. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> you know, you just accept that this is gonna happen and kind of move on with your day and don't let it get to you as much as you can. But I, we had talked, I was curious whether you encounter them as much as I do as in your, in your realm? Or is that difference between men and women or you know, being a man and a woman on the internet or oh, yeah, being get a man, the same amount? Being a, <laughs> being a white man on the internet is yeah. a great luxury. <laughs> no question. But no. you're much more prominent <clears throat> but than Jewish. I am. Yeah. But my dad's oh, yeah, Jewish, so yeah, that's, okay. uh, that's not a good that, thing. Yeah, if you, yeah, you know. yeah. Um, yeah so, so what was actually particularly interesting to me as a connoisseur of you know, racist Twitter bots, who I'm sure all come from Russia, um, uh, is that, um, so I, I, I write a lot about how our species originated in Africa, and mostly, most of its history is entirely within Africa. There's much more genetic diversity among Africans than, than people outside of Africa, because it was just a very tiny little offshoot that left Africa and produced you know, everybody else. So you know, in, in one sense, we're all Africans, just one sense. But anyway, um, the, when I would just write sort of like well, about well-established science that, that you know, fundamentally we're all Africans, um, you know, like I would get these weird things on Twitter like some picture of some you know, uh, green-eyed, pale-skinned girl and say, there's no way that this is an African, you know. I was like, what? Like, <laughs> what are you? Anyway, yeah. So I, I, I certainly get, I certainly get explosive. And, uh, and uh, sometimes people would say like, oh, well, um, you know, he's Jewish. Yeah. So of yeah. course, um, I'm not sure what, of course. But like, I can tell you, of course, I would undermine whiteness because Jews are not really white. I don't know. They call us cultural Marxists. Culture. All of us who deny Jews? It. No, no, all of us in the oh, sphere who okay. write about this. Stuff. All right. Fine. I'm really not sure. Cultural what that means. Marxism? I don't. Don't ask What's me. What's the rest We, we it's, work it's really hard to figure these people things tweet out this at me a lot. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm raising these things. I mean, they're interesting and they're and they're embedded in this this kind of science, but they all pose challenges to those of us who would kind of like to write about them without causing unintentionally. Um, more problems or more misunderstanding. I mean, some of us in the audience have been doing this for a very long time. Some of us are just starting out. I mean, what, what, what can you tell us? Well, you need to sort of, you need to, you need, to, I think journalists are, as, as a rule, don't have enough education in history. Hmm. All the, the, these labels that we're talking about, these categories, these sort of this language that we sort of kind of flip back to, it's not like we just invented it last night. 
I mean, these are, these are uh, concepts and so on that are uh, often centuries old. Like race as a concept, as, as it influences Western uh, civilization, really kicked in in the 1500s and then the 1600s and the anthropologists sort of came along and, and gave it sort of a scientific gloss. Like you gotta understand that and, and you have to understand where those ideas came from and then you have to then say like, okay, now we have all this, this genetic information, how does that map on to the, all these old ideas? Terribly, terribly. Like the language that we developed over those centuries does a terrible job of, 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 of explaining um, what scientists are finding. So you have to say it's like, well, what words am I going to use? Um, and you know, like, and you also, I think, have to sort of, you have to like, just acknowledge the fact that if you're going to write for a very broad audience in the United States, you, some of those people are going to be racist and they're going to go after you. you will, your audience will include Nazis. Like maybe we pretended that that wasn't true for a while, but I think we know now in 2018 that's true. And so you have to like reckon with that and, and um, uh, you know, and, and, and just, um, but you know, be be and also be ready to to understand that. Like, if you're writing about something and you say like, "Oh, I think this is cool. This is interesting. This surprises me," it may your some people in your audience who are who may be on Twitter um, or Facebook or wherever will respond to it in a very like unexpected way. And I think I for me like one of the most striking examples is I mean, you know, the when we talk about races, like it's a lot about color which is about pigment in our skin, you know? So we're quote unquote white. Um, and, and yet, if you, know, you can go back and look at ancient DNA from skeletons, it's not really that old in Europe, 10,000 years old, 8,000 years old. And it looks like they were fairly dark skinned. So they were not like, you know, in terms of color, they were not mm. white. Right. So whiteness in Europe didn't even exist until really like across the board, maybe, I don't know, no. 5,000 years ago? Something like that. Right. So when you write about that, I mean, I've done that, like, oh, isn't this interesting? And, and like, oh, look, the British Museum has created this picture of what someone looked like in England 10,000 years ago. Prepare for an explosion. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask you about that, but we'll have a question. Well, I actually wanted to redirect the conversation a little bit to what you brought up earlier about uh, intentional or unintentional harm of discussing some of these ideas mm. with the public. Um, because uh, this technology is so new that a lot of uh, genetic tests and some sci genetic scientists also argue that when certain mutations or uh, things pop up on your genetic test, they are obligated to share that information with you because it is your right to know because it is your DNA. And actually, I believe the uh, American Council of Medical Geneticists has a list of 56 or 59 such mutations that if they pop up on a test, uh, counselors must discuss them with the patient whether or not that was something that the test was done for in the first place. So um, I, I wanted to ask how we should um, talk about those things as journalists and also as scientists, especially since that list can very easily expand as our knowledge expands about genetics. Interesting. Hmm. Jennifer, I think this is kind of what they call the incidental loom. Yeah. yeah. Uh, things that come up in tests that were conducted for some reason, yeah. but, but the result comes up as a kind of a, uh, a happy or unhappy coincidence. So I think the short answer to your question is with great care. <laughs> uh, the longer answer, I think, um, so I'm a population geneticist and I study history, um, not medical stuff. So uh, this goes into a whole world of ethics that I'm not very um, connected to. I think that would be more of a journalism question maybe. Uh, but I can tell you, we occasionally, as a researcher who goes out into the field and collects DNA samples from people, um, 
and does informed consent and, and consultation with communities. Uh, we will co also collect genealogical information as we do this. And not infrequently, we come across situations where we have non-paternity events or situations mm. where somebody, the, the, the genealogies are not what people think they are or not what they reported to us anyway. So what do non -paternity. we- Non-paternity. Well, or, or false paternity events where- Misattributed. Mis yeah. So, so we do, that has happened before. Um, so that's kind of an analogous situation, I guess, is um, maybe. Uh, and in those situations, um, it's not my role to talk about it. So I don't, I keep that, that's confidential. So that's how I would handle a sensitive situation like that. But when it's health related, so I don't actually, in many of the agreements that I have with the populations I work with, I don't do any health research at all. It's absolutely forbidden, we just don't do it. So I, I'm, I don't think I can As a matter that. of your institutional review board? Uh, or no, um, just I, the, the IRB would let me if, if I wanted to, I suppose. Uh -huh. um, but as, as part of the community agreements, so I go into communities mm -hmm. and I say, what would you like us to work on? Here's some things that I like to do. What would you like to, you know, what kinds of questions do you have? And um, in the communities that I've worked with so far, the ones that are, they are interested in questions of ancestry and history, but no, no questions related to health. So. So I haven't encountered that, and I don't really have a good answer for you. You have a good answer, Tom? <laughs> um, well, I mean, I, I talk to clinical geneticists a, a fair amount because th this is really these are important issues. And um, uh, so, what's interesting is that that clinical geneticists will not report misattributed mm -hmm. paternity. They're like, that's not my deal. Yeah. Like, and it's so it can be so destructive mm -hmm. that they're like, nope, we're not going to talk about it. Um, but there are this, this list of 50 plus genes that clinical geneticists have decided that they, they really should talk about. Um, that list, um, you know, I think is important to um, understand how they came up with that list and how hmm. that list of mutations is different from all the other mutations that you might find if you were to prowl around your genome. Um, that list, uh, I mean, it's a really short list in the, in the, in the scheme of things. Um, and that's, that's a list of, of uh, mutations that are of like really, they're gonna cause serious disease that you need to know about now and that you might be able to do something about. They, they, they've narrowed it down like, you know, like it would be wrong for us not to tell people about this list. Um, so it's not a list that's gonna kind of willy-nilly expand to just anything. Um, but as journalists, I think we do need to uh, do a better job of explaining, um, you know, how not all mutations are alike. I mean, um, if you have, you know, on your two copies of the HTG gene, if you have one copy that has a few extra repeats in one particular region, you will get Huntington's disease. There's like no like debate about it. Um, whereas there are certain mutations that well, people with this mutation about, you know, like, you know, whereas 100 people out of 100,000 might get, say, let's say Alzheimer's, 101 out of 100,000 might get Alzheimer's if you have this mutation. In other words, there are genes that we can identify and, 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 and show, statistically speaking, that they, they do slightly raise your risk of a certain disease. But uh, that doesn't mean you're gonna get the disease. Uh, and, and you know, it depends a lot on a lot, of, a lot of other things. What are the other mutations you've inherited? What, how did you grow up? And what are you doing now? Are you smoking? And all mm -hmm. these other things. Um, and, you know, I mean, you, you don't want to, like, get your, your, your uh, I mean, it's, it, we're in this really weird situation. I don't know if you've done this, but, like, if you go to 23andMe, like, they'll give you a report, but they also give you a file. It's called a VCF file. And that is like basically like a, a little, little spreadsheet of all, like hundreds of thousands of variants in your DNA. Like, do you have a variant here, there, there, so on and so forth. And again, I'm not, do this at your own risk. Um, there are websites like Prometheus uh, where you can upload them and basically it'll pump it through a whole uh, sort of Wikipedia of genetic information and tell you everything that's been discovered about every variant you have. Hmm. It can be a very overwhelming experience. And you can sit down and say like, okay, now I'm gonna discover how I'm gonna die. Like, <laughs> and that's not what's gonna happen. And I think as journalists, we need to like, 
make it clear, like, some of these variants are, are, are authentic disease risks, but they cause a very slightly increased rate of disease. Some of these results are based on like a study of like 50 people. And then, you know, you look at 1,000 people and the, and the effect goes away. So, um, so as journalists, I mean, it's a heavy uh, burden we have because everyone thinks that all mutations are alike and they're not. Is there a question there, sir? Are you, yes, great, would you favor us? Hello, my name is Eugene Tsiang. I'm a physicist from Hawaii. I have a question. Uh, first of all, I want to say that I started out uh, being lactose intolerant, but on an uh, increasing diet of carnation canned milk, I became evolutionary more advanced, became <laughs> lactose to intolerant. <laughs> my question is this, you know, earlier this summer, I noticed that 23andMe had a sale going on. So I went for it, and I wanted to know as much about myself as possible, so I answered the questionnaire to the point where eventually the software broke because they too couldn't take any more of my questions and answers. The results came back, and it said I was 99% 99.9% Chinese, okay. So that's not very surprising, right, because I knew that. But what's surprising is, you know, I also gave this as a present to my daughter, and she took the test, and came back that she was five to ten percent, five to ten percent Manchu, and Mongol, Mongol. Okay. Now, given the given the uh, the percentage of her uh, China, uh, Asian DNA, which is fifty percent, that ten percent Mongol is, is like twenty percent. You know, if it's she were full blooded. Now, how did it happen that I'm being practically no Mongol in me have somebody like her who has 20% Mongol. And I know that from my own parents telling me that, you know, we have some Manchu ancestry. So I thought it was surprising, but then I noticed that 23andMe told me that it was a sample base of Asians, only like a few hundred. Aha, uh -huh. yes. That's it. Does that mean that the accuracy is just totally dependent on the data, the database. Uh, Jennifer, would, would you answer yes, that? Yes, yes. These um, these companies uh, make use of public databases, so publicly available data. Um, so that baseline is all the same. But then they also have proprietary databases, which are made up of mostly, I think, the customers who choose to participate in these tests, and so their databases reflect. Yep. who has participated in these, and um, you, if you were to take tests, two different tests from two different companies, you're probably gonna get two different results. Um, they may not vary tremendously, but they, they'll probably be significantly different. And um, I haven't tried this myself, but I, I, I think I should, because it, it it's interesting to me now. The other thing you've gotta take into account is the amount, what your, what your children inherit from you is gonna be sort of stochastic, random, from what they're gonna inherit from you and what they're gonna inherit from their mother. So you're gonna get a mixture, and it doesn't necessarily boil down to exactly 50-50. And then a third thing to keep in, um, in mind is that these companies are largely comparing your DNA to DNA of populations worldwide, hopefully worldwide, um, in the present day. Okay, yes. So they may have some ancient genomes mm. in their database, one hopes. I don't actually know, but they probably do. Um, but they're, they're looking largely at present day patterns of genetic variation. Mm. So if we've learned one thing from ancient DNA, it's that present day patterns of genetic variation do not necessarily reflect what, it, what the past looked like, what populations looked like in the past. People move around, people mix, people replace, populations replace one another. Um, and so you have to be very, very cognizant of this fact when you're interpreting your results, that these results are not necessarily telling you where your ancestors are from if it's not taking into account ancient DNA. That's a long answer to your question. It is, it's a very good answer. Is there a question there? Thank you both for being here, first of all. Um, Carl, you mentioned earlier that in the 90s, you would have never imagined that you would have been able to get your genome sequenced. And even today, I think 23andMe is still kind of a novelty. 
um, do those kinds of services, is that how either of you picture the average person will interact with their genome in the future? Will sequencing be a part of medical records? Or have there been other kind of practical applications that are either scary or surprising or exciting to you of, of the kinds of conversations we might be having in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years? Yeah, so, so what you get now from 23andMe is um, basically like they'll kind of look at like a sampling of your DNA and um, it's called genotyping. I think they're up to maybe a million. So basically about 0.1% of your DNA is what they'll look at. It's, it's a good way to kind of get a, a rough read of, of your genome. Um, but this DNA sequencing is getting so cheap that it's actually getting, it's probably very soon gonna be, make just as much sense to just sequence all your DNA. So if you get your DNA sequenced, rather than saying like, we're gonna genotype you, or we're just gonna sequence one gene really carefully, I would say within 10 years, people are gonna say like, we're just gonna sequence your DNA. So then the issue becomes, well, should we just do that for every baby at birth, and that's just in your medical record. Um, I think the jury's still out about whether that's gonna really help. Um, the National Institutes of Health has a big precision medicine project going on that might, maybe might help us to understand if that actually helps or not. Um, I think though, if, if genome sequencing just gets super cheap, then it's gonna be the answer that goes, well, why not? And then, like, then the issue will become, well, what do you use your genome for in terms of your health? Um, so, you know, like if you discover, if you're like a, the small fraction of people who discover that you have like a, a really serious mutation that you need to, to pay attention to, like, well, that's good to know. On the public health level, that's, that's actually a good thing. Um, I think actually um, a lot of people will actually be benefit from something I learned by looking at my genome, which is that if, God forbid, I were to get hepatitis, there are certain drugs that won't do me any good because I have certain genes. Pharmacogenomics, as it's called. I, th I think that pharmacogenomics might be the kind of the low-hanging fruit of genome sequencing. That, because like doctors so often, like if you, if, you ha if you get sick, they're like, well, let's try this. You know, and it might be hepatitis, it might be depression, all sorts of things. Like, well, that didn't work very well, well let's try this. You know, wouldn't it be nice if we could just skip the stuff that doesn't work and go to the stuff that does. So, um, so that might be kind of where m medicine goes in terms mm. of using our genomes and understanding how heredity affects our health. I'd like to ask Jennifer just a quick follow-up to that. So here's a world in which every child gets their entire genome sequenced at birth. Surely this is a bioinformatics computer storage problem of such staggering proportions that it, it ought to be useless. You traffic in the raw material of population genetics. I mean, can you conceive a way in which we can all have our little flash drive or our little DNA chip or whatever with that much information on it that can actually be clinically useful? And I realize you're not a clinician. I'm not, no, ask, yeah. I'm not asking it yeah, that way. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think technically. Because what I'm wondering yeah. is, as we as journalists, no offense, are we being a little gullible about the future here? No, not exactly. I, yes, we could definitely do that, I think. Um, but I, I want to inject a note of caution in here. I'm going to put my anthropologist hat on for a Please minute. Please do. Um, not every person wants their genome sequenced. Not every population wants genetic studies done on them, medical or ancestry. Um, I bring this back to my own research. There are Native American tribes who are not interested in participating in genetics research for a variety of reasons. They may simply not be interested in it because it doesn't tell them anything they really particularly care about. Or they may have a very understandably negative view of colonialism and scientific research being imposed upon them mm -hmm. and nothing but negative consequences emerging from that. And so we, and I, I fall into this trap too, tend to think this is positive, this is important, this is really good, it's gonna be a benefit for everybody. But you also have to take a step back and ask, well, will it be a benefit for everybody? It might not. Um, it may be harmful to some groups, not all groups, but it may be harmful. And so we need to make space in our conversation for that to be a legitimate perspective. And as a geneticist, of course, I want to sequence everybody and study <laughs> them. 
but as an anthropologist, I know that that's not appropriate and it could even be harmful. So mm -hmm. we have to balance that. You have a question back there? In common conversation and a lot of science writing and a lot of academia, we talk about racial demographic categories and the US Census does it and we all talk this way as if, and there is an assumption underneath all that, if you're not thinking like an anthropologist or a geneticist who knows that these are not biological categories, that they are biologically grounded as science communicators, what can we do about that? Mm. Beyond writing over and over and over, these are not biologically grounded yeah. concepts. How can we change how we write about these variables when we say the researchers broke down the results by race? Do we say, which is a cultural identification, not a genetically grounded concept? Is that the solution or is there some other solution? That's a great question. Can so I bring it back to something Carl said earlier, please. which is know the history of these terms, know the history of racial categories in the United States. Um, that will really help you to write more sensitively about this and also make sure that you're writing your piece by different people of different backgrounds so that you, you, know, you may not be necessarily aware that, oh, when I write about this, I'm actually using language that harms Native Americans, for example. But, um, one thing that I want to point out, two things I want to point out. First, it is scientifically inaccurate to say that populations don't vary genetically. They do. Um, there's this straw man that's sort of erected, I think, by certain groups who say, oh, you guys say that there's no such thing as race, in popul but populations vary genetically, and you know, you're wrong about that. It's not true. Populations are different genetically. The question is, how much? Are they different? We talk about this. I mean, how much are they different, and what does that difference mean? And is, are our racial categories a useful way to describe that variation and what it means? The answer to that last question is no, in my opinion, in the opinion of lots of us. Um, but that doesn't mean that these racial categories aren't real in some sense. And what I mean by that is, yes, they are culturally constructed categories, but they actually have biological effects. And this is so hard to write about, and I don't know how to advise you on this, but when we create the race black or African American or whatever we're gonna call it, we put people into that category regardless of their genetic background, right? So I always come back to this example, President Obama is just as much Irish as he is African American, right? But we code him as black, right? We don't necessarily know what variants he's gonna have in his genome unless we sequenced his genome, right? But when we do that, when we categorize and classify people, we, re we actually can, ha that can have biological effects. We know that stress levels in African Americans are chronically high because of racism, because of structural racism, these categories that we've created, right? That is biological, that's real. It may not be because of the genetic variants that they had, or there may be some complicated you know, interaction there, but these categories that we create, these social categories, have biological effects. That is really hard to get across, and I'm not sure I'm doing a good job of it now, but yeah. <laughs> You've made a brave effort. I want to <laughs> sneak in one more question before we have to go, please. I was wondering if you could touch a little bit on some of the misconceptions that might, one might encounter around the genetics of sex, and what are hmm. some of the ways that science writers could um, better communicate X and Y, for instance. Carl. Hmm. Yeah, um, well, um, I would, there, it, it, there, just as there's human genetic variation among populations, there are, there are differences uh, between males and females that that have a genetic basis, um, and you know whether it's in the brain or in other structures and, and so on, but um, but those differences are not like carte blanche to say anything you want <laughs> about how men and women are different. And it's very tempting, just as it's tempting to look at two different groups of any group of people and say like, oh, you're different, you're different, and it's genes, and I'm done. Um, uh, so um, 
So you have to be super careful. I mean, you know, there is interesting research that's coming up as we speak about um, understanding how having two X chromosomes or having an X chromosome and a Y chromosome leads to impacts on your biology. But, um, you know, when you're a reporter, like, talk to your, to your sources and say, like, well, how far can we take this implication? You know, if there's a difference in the brain, does that mean that, like, things that we see in the workplace can be pinned down to genetic differences in the brain? My bet is that your source will say no. Um, and, and so, so, you know, get to understand uh, the importance of genetic differences and also the limits of them. I want to change, unless you have something you no, want. No, that was a good answer. I want to change the subject just a tad. We've been having a very interesting conversation about our troubling relationship with this research. And there's something I want to explore a little bit as we conclude, which is you're a scientist, you come to this as a researcher, and yet you have transformed yourself into a writer of some skill, ability to reach out to the public. Um, I'm curious how you did that. Uh, we at NYU pay a lot of attention to trying to help scientists who want to communicate to the public, uh, get some practice at that, get some skills. Uh, uh, it's increasingly the case that scientists can take their own story directly to the public. But now you, uh, what, you had three postdocs? I, I mean, yes. you were really <laughs> hustling there. <laughs> what uh, did you do, what moved you to want to take your interests directly to the public? And, and, and how did you learn? What did you do? Mm -hmm. did you just jump into the deep end of the pool? Kind what? of, yeah. So my um, interest in science writing was sparked by the fact that I was concerned I wasn't going to have an academic job waiting for me at the end of my many postdocs. So the, um, I'm sure you guys are aware the academic job market is poor and the prospects are not great. Uh, and I never wanted to be anything other than a scientist and an academic. Um, but I kind of came during my second postdoc at Northwestern, I started to realize, well, wait, this might not work. <laughs> um, so I began to blog as a way of teaching myself to write better for, for a general audience. Um, scientists are not trained to do that at all. And, uh, and I just learned through trial and error and just writing and writing and writing and blogging and figuring out what worked. And for me, what worked on my blog was writing about things that I got angry about, so mostly vaccines. I mean, the anti-vaccine <laughs> movement, that was sort of my entry into science writing. I was, you know, it would just really get me going. And uh, <laughs> so uh, I ended up writing, and um, a few of my blogs started going viral, and then they started going really viral, and I didn't really know how to handle that. But um, I kind of learned over time and got how better. How did it feel to go viral the first it's time? It's really scary, really it's scary. scary. Yeah, yeah, because you're, I mean, it was exciting and exhilarating, but I was like, I can't handle all these comments. What am I going to do? <laughs> you know, so yeah, it was fun, but scary. And eventually I started um, writing more about my own field and about genetics um, and about papers coming out. And I have this real drive to teach people how to read scientific papers, like regular people, how to do that. So I wrote a blog about that, and that went viral. I mean, it's, it was great. Um, and, and this kind of developed into this thing where I started just blogging papers, not necessarily mine, although I do blog every paper I write. Um, I started blogging other people's papers, and apparently there is an audience for that. So that kind of took off. And, and how was this yeah. regarded in your department? Uh well, as a postdoc, they don't really care too much <laughs> what you're I doing see. as long I as see. you're working and getting, you know, getting data mm -hmm. and doing, doing good work. So that was fine. Uh, now I am you know, faculty and I'm pre-tenure. So um, uh -huh. you know, I, there's this, this concern of mine that, oh, is this going to be enough? I won't say too much about this in case you know, the dean is watching. No, <laughs> just kidding. Um, they've actually been very supportive in my department. And, and this, has so. this uh, writing for the general public had any kind of uh, I don't know, blowback effect on your scientific writing? I mean, I would be lying if I didn't say that it definitely takes time. And now that I'm teaching, I really don't blog that much for my own blog because I, I just don't have time for that. I've got all these other writing projects that I've got to do. 
So you really have to prioritize. But um, one thing that it has done is it has made me a faster, better writer of my scientific papers. It really has. I can, I can write a grant now and I, I feel confident about it. I know that I'm communicating my message. Whether or not the reviewers like it, I, I know that at least I've done my part and I can feel more confident in that. So it has given me some good benefits. And it's also connected me with colleagues um, that I wouldn't normally have interacted with. This is an example of one of those situations. I would not have interacted with you guys probably. Um, and I can give you like many different instances where my blogging and my science writing has actually helped my science. Um, so it's been very positive overall. And to sort of just flip it, Carl, how do you maintain fluency technically in such a rapidly changing field? What's your technique? Yeah, I mean, I basically, I, um, I, 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 I realized at some point that like, you know, that the sort of the baseline that I might have learned in high school and college just is gone. <laughs> and it's gone every 10 years, or maybe every five years, it's just gone. And, and so that I actually will say like, okay, like, it's been a while, I have to like actually like sort of rebuild my understanding of this field from the ground up again. Like, okay, how do people do the basic stuff? How do people sequence DNA? Mm -hmm. You know, like they're, we're about to, I think we're about to go through a, like a totally fundamental shift. Right now, there's still kind of a preference to use very short fragments mm -hmm. of DNA, a certain kind of technology. I think that's about to change. I think, you know, the technology will look at very, very long stretches of DNA. So if I'm writing like, oh, and the scientist did this and the scientist did that, like, I can't just assume that it's what I knew was true in 2015. Like, it's gone. It's going to be gone. And so, like, I think you do, you actually have to very actively, like, take some time out and, you know, put yourself in a personal re-education camp. Hmm. I'm kind of stunned. I, I, I haven't gone back to re-education camp. It's I, high time. I, 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 feel, I feel the dust settling on my shoulders, you know, truly. So when you look forward, the two of you, um, what's, what's the thing that we as science journalists, as scientists who write, what is the thing that you see on the horizon that we should be paying attention to now? Oh, gosh. Well, I think this conversation is a good illustration of the complexity of talking about um, personal ancestry testing and identity and genetics. And I think I w if I could have my wish list, I would love to see journalists writing more about these complicated issues and maybe coming up with some language for us scientists to use when we talk to you guys or talk to the public about you know how to convey this complexity. I hope the English majors can do that. <laughs> <laughs> Carl, I, I know your editor is in the audience not to give away your next book or next book proposal, but what's your answer to that question? About what's coming next? That well, we, so many things are coming next. Yes. What's the thing that we should be paying attention to? Well, in this area, in terms of heredity and in terms of, of understanding you know, DNA and what, how it influences us, um, I mean, we've been talking about some important, pretty heavy stuff, but I think we also like have to kind of you know, we have to make a little space for the wonder of it and the awe, you know, that we're getting DNA out of fossils that are 50,000, 100,000 years old. These fossils are from some of our, an our ancestors. Like, that's amazing to me. And, and um, I expect that we are going to see scientists getting DNA out of other fossils, of other kinds of humans, mm -hmm or human relatives, other species related to us, like Homo erectus. Like, it's coming, I, I expect. I don't know how optimistic you are. Uh, you're really I don't know. Uh, maybe I'm, I'm more yeah, optimistic. Yes, yes, in general. Homo erectus specifically? Yeah. I'm just saying that I... I <laughs> maybe. <laughs> look, look, like, a big part of what I do as a journalist, not just as a book author, as a journalist, writing for the New York Times is, like, writing about insights that come from ancient DNA. Now, ancient DNA, as, as, a, as a beat, did not exist in the 1990s. But I'm at the point now where like, I'll, I'll say to my editor, like, um, 
Okay, there are three ancient DNA papers coming out this week. I can only write about one. So let's figure out, let's do some triage. W which one am I going to write about? You know, is it this one, this one, this one? Like, it's so much stuff that's coming out. And it's, it's, it's astonishing. And, and, it's, and it is changing the way we think about the past few thousand years of history, the past few hundred thousand years of human evolution. And I think that, you know, in the next 10 years, we're going to see some, some really shocking things. That's what I predict. On that note, I want to thank both of you. I asked uh, at the beginning of, the, of, of this conversation the essential question, who am I, who are you, who are us? And what I can say is that all of us now have been informed, uplifted, and changed uh, <laughs> down to our genes, <laughs> epigenetically speaking, hey. <laughs> by what we've heard tonight. I thank you so much for sharing your expertise and your thoughts, really. Thank you. Now, um, I hope uh, maybe we can continue the conversation informally. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Dan? Boy, that was a great, that was a great conversation. Thank you both very much. Uh, we do, we've got more wine, more beer, <laughs> more water, more juice, more cookies. So uh, let's, uh, let's keep it going. Thank you all very much for coming. What a good crowd. Thank you both very much.